Hey, welcome to Live Lessons. I'm Steve Krenz. Thank you so much for being here with us. We are coming at you not quite live from uh, legendary Grun Guitars here in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And we are, this is going to be a, a fabulously fun night, and we're so honored to have with us Musicians Hall of Fame guitarist from the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section, the great Will McFarlane. Right. <laughs> And this is part of our Guitar Gathering Conference, so we have a wonderful studio audience of everybody here that is uh, here for the conference. So um, give yourselves a hand, you, all you wonderful folks that have been here. Yeah! And uh, Grunes is just treating us royally here, so it is uh, great. Um, we are going to play a little bit. What? Well, pick a key. I don't know. How about A? A, all right, the, all right. The National Key of Canada. <laughs> hey. Yes.
<laughs> we're, we're still working on our big ending. Yeah. The big ending. Yeah. The big ending. You've had such an amazing career over the years. Every time I look at your Facebook page, there's a new picture up there of you playing with somebody that I, I didn't know about. So how long were you? You were with Bonnie Raitt probably the longest. Yeah, I was. I, I started, I did the Late for the Sky tour with her and Jackson Brown in 1974. That was amazing because, you know, I've been playing, you know, clubs and 10 bucks a night and all the beer I could drink. And, <laughs> and uh, her manager started showing up at my gigs. And he's a real odd duck. I love him. I adore him. Just saw him. He lives in Oxford, Mississippi. And he's a very literate, brilliant man, photojournalist. Some of the most iconic pictures of Robert Kennedy and Janis Joplin and Ted Williams. I mean, really interesting. And all the early iconic stuff of... Bonnie and Mississippi Fred McDowell and Sunhouse and all those, Dick took those pictures. Matter of fact, when Buddy Guy got the Kennedy Award thing, three of the six pictures that they put huge, you know, up mm -hmm. over the stage, Dick took. And, and Dick just took a liking to me mm -hmm. and uh, thought I'd be good for her. And she had just been traveling as a duo uh, with Freebo her bass player, and they decided that to open for Jackson for that tour, she needed her own band. So I was technically in her first live band, you know, and uh, we did 50 cities, and then she kept me around for another five years. And we went all over the world. We went to Japan and Europe many times, and played the Midnight Special and Saturday Night Live, and it was, a, it was an interesting run. My dad still wasn't sure, you know, that I wasn't wasting my mind, because <laughs> I'd broken a multiple, multiple generational streak at the Naval Academy, and then I dropped out of school and moved into Greenwich Village. And it's one of those funny jokes. You come home for Christmas, and what are you doing? And my stepsister's getting her M.A. from Harvard, and stepbrother's getting his master's in architecture from Penn. And what are you doing, Will? And it was like, well, I just did open mic night at Gertie's Folk City. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know... But in 1975, we played Carnegie Hall. I played Carnegie Hall with Bonnie. I thought that would be great. And I called my dad, you know, on the phone and said, hey, dad, I just played Carnegie Hall because I figured that would have some kind of credibility. And, and he went, great, great. Thinking about going back to school? <laughs> so, so here we are 50 some odd years later. And, uh, and it was actually delightful. Dad had never really seen me play professionally. I mean, I'd at a family reunion or something, but he always lived, you know, he retired to South Florida and I was all over the place. And, and uh, when we got inducted by their great largesse, I must say, I played with the Muscle Shoals rhythm section, the Swampers, you know, you hear in the song, Sweet Home Alabama, now Muscle Shoals has the Swampers. and They've had Dwayne Allman and Pete Carr and a bunch of real players, but I played with them for 20 years. And, uh, and uh, they invited me, they, they basically, when they were nominated to go in, they said, well, we couldn't have done it without our friends. And they said, well, who are your friends? And I was mentioned as one of them. So when I went in, I called my dad. I said, Dad, I would like you to come see me play. He goes, oh, I'll just have fun. You know, I said, no, I'd like you to come see me play. And, and he did. And he showed up, and I introduced him to all sorts of people that he adored, like Barbara Mandrell. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, he used to love her, her hour, you know, yeah, and, uh, specials, yeah. and when I was standing, somebody, Barbara walked over and said, hello, we're glad to have you there. And somebody said, let's get a picture. I put my arm around her and my wife. And, and I think I went up more in my father's estimation in that one second, getting my picture <laughs> taken with Barbara Mandrill. <laughs> and dad and I, I mean, we, we worked it all out. You know, we truly did. And that night was a big deal because Steve Cropper, if you don't mind me telling the story, Steve Cropper yeah. uh, was, went in with Booker T that night too. And I knew Steve, we did an Etta James record together and, uh, and, um, Steve, who wrote uh, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. Which yeah, he co-wrote that. that must, uh, I mean, uh, Knock on Wood, he co-wrote Midnight Hour. I mean, yeah. he, he's the Blues Brothers. The Blues yeah. Brothers and, and he's iconic. He's the opening light. You know, anything like that, you know, that's, that's Cropper. Or the... Watching the tide. You know, all those kind of iconic, classic rhythm guitar licks uh, with Steve. And Steve spoke when he got his award, and he said, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted a guitar, and my dad said we didn't have the money. And so I did anything. I shined shoes, I sold papers, I mowed lawns, and I bought me a $17 guitar at Sears and Roebuck. And I brought it home, and my dad said, son, you learn to play that thing. I'll get you a better one. 
And he said, my dad made good on his word. And I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Hollis Crawford and Cropper. And his dad stood up and the place gave him a standing over and over the top of it. He's going and he drove me to every gig and carried my equipment. I'm thinking of my dad, you know, threatened to take my guitar away if I got a B in school. <laughs> and, and my dad's sitting right in the second row and and uh, and he just got it. He just got it. It was like he'd never seen the honor and. And it, it changed everything. He started calling me up, giving me like career advice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I just heard the song, Wind Beneath My Wings. You could write that song. <laughs> you know, and so we, we ended up having really amazing conversations after that. And, uh, and he's passed on now, but, uh, but it was really good to totally have one of those reconciliatory seasons in our lives where he finally went, yeah, my son's a musician. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what he used to say. But. <laughs> what year was that that y'all were inducted in the Musicians Hall We were Hall inducted thing? in 2008. So I think we were the second batch that went in. Was your dad still alive? Yeah, he was. He was. He came to the show and, uh, and did. It was really funny. You know, it was actually a sort of a funny thing to vicariously look at all this through, through my father. You know, like we got a lunch that day at Nashville. I just thought maybe getting some chicken soup before the gig would be <laughs> healthy. And so we went to Nashville, and as we were walking out, I thought, I, I thought it was Kid Rock walking in. And he sort of had a posse with him. And you've heard all sorts of stories about Kid Rock or whatever, but I thought, I turned to my son, I went, is that Kid Rock? Because I knew I was going to be playing with him next night because we did old-time rock and roll with Kid Rock when we were inducted. And we, we also did When a Man Loves a Woman with Percy Sledge. And, I mean, it was a really good musical night. And... Uh, and I went, well, I'm going to go meet the guy. Want you? And so we all walked back in, and, and he's sitting down there, and, you know, he's being Kid Rock, and he's got, you know, his posse around him. And, and, uh, and I said, hey, man, I'm from Muscle Shoals. I'm playing with you tomorrow. And he jumped right up. Man, it's great to meet you. I said, this is my dad. And he's like, hello, Mr. McFarland. I mean, he was just a really gracious, nice guy. And I went, Dad, you just met Kid Rock, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. I think he'd actually maybe heard of him, but, uh, but so, you know, and Charlie McCoy was there and, yeah. you know, Barbara Mandrell and George Jones and, yeah. and we were inducted, uh, the spokesman who did it was Ed King from Skinner, you know, yeah. he said, now, if you've heard that he wrote the riff for Sweet Home Alabama, Sweet Home Alabama. and he was a yeah. good friend and hated to see him pass. Yeah. And, and, um, he introduced us and it was just one of those at the skirmer horn and, yeah. Everybody was black tie. I was wearing Hugo Boss velvet. <laughs> I was wearing a velvet jacket. Had a red ribbon around. And, no. and it was just very, very cool. You know, it was a good night. And that really was a night that, you know, he did the dad thing too. I'd swipe my credit card. I had all my kids and some of my grandkids. And, and it doesn't matter how late you, you get your father's blessing. I think every one of us wants, wants, yeah. wants our father's blessing and, and that'll preach. But, uh, uh, Wow. Um, let's, I, I know you play all kinds of different instruments, um, different guitars, and you have to when you're, when you're doing your type of work, but you've got a rather special one I love tonight. this guitar. Talk, talk about that amazing instrument you've got. Well, you know, uh, when my twins were born, I have boy-girl twins and a younger son, but our boy-girl twins will be 46 here in a month or so. And, uh, and when they were born... I stayed home, you know, I just missed the Bonnie Raitt tour. And, uh, and she hired Rick Vito to do the tour. And somewhere in the middle of the tour, uh, she called me because she was doing a, a video, a, a documentary or whatever with Sippy Wallace. If you remember, Sippy Wallace wrote Women Be Wise and some of the stuff Bonnie's famous for singing. And, um, <clears throat> and she just was more comfortable with me. I'd been with her you know, for four years by then. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she said, Rick, would you mind if I called? So anyway, so Rick and I were both in Bonnie's band at the same time. We did some guitar trading and stuff like that. And then he went off and played with, he replaced, well, when... Uh, yeah, he was doing Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, right? he was a front man for Fleetwood Mac when Lindsey Buckingham left the band. So he's a rock star, you know. I mean, he's also the guy that did the slide on Like a Rock for Bob Seger. Remember that Chevy commercial? And that's why I say to the young guys, you know, that, that, mm, that great stuff. And he said, well, let me try a slide. And apparently Bob Seger had said, I don't know. And he said, well, just give me one pass. That's one pass. That's just off the top of his head. That's, some, that's just great. And anyway, Rick and I lost touch over the years. 
And then little by little, through Facebook and things like that, we responded to one another here and there, and ran into each other at a NAMM show. And he came to Muscle Shoals. There's a vintage guitar store down there, and he wanted to buy a jazz master. And he came down there, and he called me, said, let's grab coffee while I'm in town or whatever. And uh, the, the buying lasted a little longer. And he said, well, anyway, Will, I've got this guitar here. It's my new prototype. And I would honestly like your objective opinion about it. And, I, and he opened the case and went, well, that's way too flashy for me. You know, it's like the mother of toilet seat thing. And, <laughs> you know, when you're looking up guitars and it says Modo, you know, if you've ever wondered what that means, that's short for mother of toilet seat. <laughs> that's what it, it, it's the purloid thing. And he, the art deco, he said the toughest thing about this guitar was getting all the binding, which has to go this way. Yeah. Getting it bound together and doing the art deco thing he's always a, such an artsy guy you know and he's he's really always been a real stylish guy and and i just love the guy and um and he said and i said oh no you don't have to leave that with me and I, no I, I really like your opinion so i took it home and i plugged in the first thing that got me was it's got this volume knob right there and most humbucker guitars i was talking about it earlier you know they have two volume two tone and you even see the best 335 les paul guys they hit a note and then they sort of move a knob and hit another note. Because when you're in the middle and you, and you move the volume knob, the tone changes and everybody's looking for tone and, you know, and so everything. Well, this just goes. You know, you can just go just right there. I can't do that on a Les Paul. So this is really, I immediately noticed that its ergonomic thing was so easy. And I need a humbucker guitar every now because I'm mostly a studio guy and they're just the best power chords, you know. And so I was, you know, but, but I'd get it set the way I like it and then use it. But I wouldn't go out on stage with them almost ever. And I wanted to go out on stage periodically, especially when you play with some of the blues guys, you yeah, know. Yeah. And, um, and have some humbuckers. And I just started falling in love with it. And he'd call me, he calls me about two weeks. He says, oh, what do you think? I said, I'm falling in love with this thing, man. I don't think I'm going to give it back to you. And he goes, no, I got to have it back, Will, but I'll start looking for one for you. And he started looking for one, and nobody wanted to give him up. And he said, I'll find you one out there. And they come also apparently in like some kind of mauve pink color and a, yeah, gray, and a gray color, yeah. too. But none of them have the volume knob right there. It's volume here and here. You know, it's like that. And that was a deal breaker. I said, that volume knob is a deal breaker. And we just kept talking about it. And he finally says, ah, it's just your guitar. You know, so. Kind of run us through some of the sounds that you can get through that. Well, it's, I've got it set. It, it notches this blend control right here. If you can see, you know, it sounds real BB Kingish, you know, that. You know, it's got that real bluesy thing. If you back it this way, it goes. Or you can go the, you get that steel. So, you know, it's got that and it, you know, also, I, I guess I, you know, if you go, you know, whatever, you know, that probably hurts something out there. <laughs> the sound well, man just went, fantastic. Ah! Yeah, but, um, but so it's got the power chord thing, but then when you move it forward too, it's also got that real Santana, you know, Just very clean, you know. You know, so, and it's just in a moment's notice. I'm on the front pickup, I'm on the back pickup, I'm in the middle, and I'm getting a little brighter, I'm getting a little warmer. You know, it's just a great little thing. I thought, how have I played the guitar for like 50 years? <laughs> Never heard of a blend switch. I want to <laughs> put one in my Les Paul on 330, you know, I want to, but I won't. But, but so it's, it's become my humbucker go-to guitar. Yeah. And, um... And it just really, and it's beautiful, and the neck is beefy and yeah. feels real, yeah. you know, yeah. just really, it's really a warm instrument. Those are made by Reverend guitars. Rick's, yeah. Rick's been a uh, uh, Reverend guy for a long time, Reverend guitars, and they always have that cool kind of retro thing happen. It's a beautiful instrument. Yeah, it really is. He's got a new signature model out now, I guess, when he couldn't get this one back. No, but, <laughs> but they keep, you know, he's just such a great player. They just give him options is what it is. And, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your tone and your touch on the, on the instrument. It's just so, I mean, you can play two or three notes and, and it just has 
has that sustain in it. Talk a little bit about your, your touch on the instrument. Well, I think one of the things about an electric guitar, you know, I, it's funny, when I was a kid and I'd watch the Flintstones, that, you know, was on TV, he'd always have to get the car going, like with his feet, and I would think, why? You know, <laughs> like if it's a car, like, it, you know what I'm saying, in my little five-year-old brain, there was something that thought, and a lot of people think they have to drive this thing. They think they have to run to get it started. But the thing about an electric guitar is the tone is, it, it all starts at your fingers. It yeah. really does. It's, you know, people argue wood pickups. I've replaced pickups and guitars and I hear the difference, but the average listening, you know, they're not going, well, we'll switch pickups. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're not thinking that. They're, and, um, and no matter what instrument I've ever picked up, even playing through amps that I particularly hate, you know, which there's just very few, but maybe yeah. like those silver face master volume twin reverbs or something that just feel like an ice pick that I can't get any tone out of. But if you, if you, you know, if you go... You know, as opposed to... It's just, you don't need to hit it that hard. And I think a lot of the... Just sort of just touch it and let the guitar speak to you. Sort of like, you know, we've learned some skills by being married 470 musician years. <laughs> and, you know, they'll say, well, a woman needs eight to 12 meaningful touches a day. And you can't just go at nine o'clock at night and go, man, I'm six behind. <laughs> it just doesn't work. You know, you still have to touch it, you know? And that's what I think about an electric guitar. Yeah. They're shaped in a beautiful way, and uh, except for the weird ones, and that's a whole new era. But uh, I think that the sweeter you touch them, the more you get out of them. That's just me. Yeah. And it's an interesting story that I've told before, but one of my mentors was Reggie Young. And Reggie... Yeah is maybe one of the most recorded guitar players of all time. He's the intro to Drift Away. He's the intro to Son of a Preacher Man. He's the sitar on Cry Like a Baby. He's, he's the solo on That's the Way Love Goes for Merle Haggard. You know, he, he's the he's solo on Poncho and Lefty for Willie and Merle. He, he, he spans all, he's the ba -ba 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 on skinny legs, you know what I mean? He's just, he's bon -da 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 -da. suspicious minds for elvis i mean you don't realize how often you've heard reggie play and reggie was one of the most generous with his knowledge he was never threatened by the next guy who came up and i know that because i went to see him before he passed and um and his beautiful wife said, would you like to plug into his rig? And it was like a shrine to me. You know, it was Reggie's amp and his pedal board and his studio rig. And I sit, plugged into it. And I started telling this story that when I was in L.A. at one point, I'd played on a record. And there were a bunch of rock stars on the record. And I ran into him one night at the Troubadour, one of these rock stars. And I said, man, we're both on so-and-so's record together. And he was like, yeah, whatever. And I was, uh, <laughs> I said, I know it's probably geeky for me on a Monday night at the Troubadour, but uh, I'm just curious what you use. He went, yeah, that's for me to know. And I was like, you know, it's for me to know and you to find out. Well, the first time I ever worked with Reggie, he was doing something just beautiful. And I said, what are you doing over there? And he goes, you know, Will, I've just been screwing around with this position. And here, come plug into my rig. And I just realized he was never threatened because he knew what he did even if I learned it note for note, it was going to sound like me when I played it, and yeah. he was going to sound like him when yeah. he played it, because it really does start at your fingers. And, um, and that was just such a, a beacon to me, and it's the way to be, is just be generous. You know, There's an old Solomon proverb that says, is, is a man generous, he'll find favor with God and man, and that seems like a good way to go. So, so I, I try to be generous you know, and say, take it easy. I remember one, one time you had said a few years back, so learn to create a tone that you love, that you that you learn yeah. how to get make the instrument even in sim the simplest of things, 
make it sustain and make it sing like you want it to sing. Well, especially when people, a lot of young guys go for speed first. Mm -hmm. And speed will come as you get a little muscle memory under your belt. But if you go for speed before you go for sound or tone, yeah. you know, you'll hear guys trying to be fast and they miss, you know, half the notes, you know, and it would be like me speaking to you tonight. Every now and then it changes. It would become maddening to you if, if I dropped words and dropped syllables and, and some players sort of play like that because they're going for more. And as I said, less is more sometimes, you know, the greatest lick, you know, like that. Those are that, you know, the song is in the holes. And if you're serving the song, you don't want to fill every available hole in the music, you know. And a lot of times you'll see the young guys trying to, you know, show mm -hmm. what they know. And, and that's OK. That's part of all of our, you know, when you go from plagiarism to influence to style, you know, at, at the beginning, you're just robbing people. They go, ah, that's a B.B. King lick or whatever. And yeah. then they go, I hear you've been listening to B.B. King. Mm -hmm. And one day they'll say, man, I heard this guy the other night sounded like you. And you don't know when it changed. It just does as we as we grow. And and uh, I think that that if you if you just go, you know, whatever. And I like that note. I want to go. Then don't get any faster than you. You know, just don't don't try to get any faster until you make them all have the, the quality of sound that that you like. That yeah. you're given to people that you say, I'm going to put this out in the world and, yeah. you know. Just, you know, talk with it. Whatever, I'm just. <laughs> no, that's. Done. Lightly, you know. Just touch it nicely and. It always reminds me of when my kid brother was like three or something. He'd found a hammer at my grandfather's house. There were flagstones around the outside of his house. And my grandmother started hearing this bang, this really loud bang. And she was on the third floor and she's looking out this window and she sees my three-year-old brother with a hammer and he's killing ants. <laughs> and they're just, there's a line of ants walking across the flagstone. He's pulling the hammer back to about here and going bang and just bringing sparks and about to crack the flagstones. And she just very calmly said, hit them gently, Bobby, they'll die. <laughs> and that's become one of our family <laughs> mottos, you know, hit, hit them gently, they'll die. And, and so uh, good it's good advice. <laughs> uh, can you play us something? Or let's, let's, let's play something. What do you want to do? Yeah. I, we we're, we certainly can, as I said. I'm um, or 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 you can just play us a tune. I could play me a t pick us a tune, boy. <laughs> or we can do what were we doing earlier, sunny side of the street. Yeah, I might have to think too much on that one. Though. Okay, but let me um, I'll give you something real simple. Uh, I'm in a band with some fellow musicians around here in town. We're all session guys, and here in Nashville, one of the hip things to do is put a a tribute band together. You know, there's a Steely Dan tribute band. If you ever get a chance to see it, they're called 12 Against Nature. 12 Against Nature. They're Tom, amazing. Tom Hemby and his group. Tom yeah. Hemby. Yeah. But Michael McDonald sits in with them. I mean, yeah. they're really good. Yeah. And there's a Eagle Maniacs. There's an Eagle yeah. band. There's a Allman Brothers. There's a Santana band. And we decided we wanted to do one of our favorite bands, which was Little Feet. And uh, one of the cool things about being in Bonnie's band in the 70s is we toured with Little Feet a lot. And, and one of the scariest times I've ever had is Lowell goes, come on out and do sailing shoes with me for the encore. And it was like, you know. But he plugged me into his dumble and, you know, through <laughs> delays and all this stuff. The first time I ever used delay and I went, <laughs> you know, and it went, oh, out in the audience. <laughs> and I went, okay, I think I'm going to use that after. <laughs> But uh, we loved Little Feet. We put a we could do Waiting for Columbus like almost no for note a bunch of it, and, and uh, but we're all songwriters and we all wrote some songs and we put a record out in January and they released it January 27th and by Monday it had 300,000 streams, and so 
they didn't know what to do with it. You know, all of a sudden they were hiring people to try to, you know, figure out what to do with us. And anyway, I wrote four of the songs on that record. And uh, let me just do a fun little song here. Happy face, everything's falling into place. My best dreams are coming true. That's what I get for loving you. You best get used to seeing this smile, cause it may be there for quite a while. It's all I seem to want to do. That's what I get for loving you. That's what I get for thinking about you. Night and day, I never had anything to go this way. And I'm most surprised to see you feel the same way for me i used to think that love was one long fight very little ever turned out right but you've given me a whole new point of view that's what i get for loving you So nice, do it twice. That's what I get for thinking about you night and day. I never had anything to go this way. And I'm most surprised to see You feel the same way for me Reason for this happy face Everything falling into place My best dreams are coming true That's what I get for loving you, baby that's what I get for loving you. Oh, yeah. That's what I get for loving you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, do you, anybody have a question for... Will, style, some of the wonderful people you've played with along the way? You just think with wonderful. Josh Stone. Uh, I did a okay. record with Josh Stone, and she was delightful. And it happened uh, that she had Ernie Isley on guitar. Oh, my God. And, um, and had Tony Royster Jr. on drums, who was like a pearl in Dorsey when he was 11 or something really good and the melodic players on it Clayton Ivy from Muscle Shoals and Clayton Ivy did patches for Clarence Carter and one bad apple fancy for you know I mean just he's he was Chet Atkins band leader so he's he's he knows stuff matter of fact half the theory that I've learned you know he there'd be a chord like this you know he'd go like a go, yeah, on that half diminished, we'll put the D flat on top. And I'd be just thinking, man, I'm just, I'm just faking it on my way. <laughs> and, um, and Clayton's a brilliant piano player, and, uh, and he was playing piano on it. They wanted a Muscle Shoals guy. Mm -hmm. And they hit an impasse on some old soul song. 
it was something like If You Don't Know Me By Now, or some, some old song, but it was acoustic. They were doing it acoustically, and it just wasn't Ernie's thing. It just wasn't, and there was nobody there. And he said, well, you ought to get Will McFarlane. And so I drove up just to do one song, and Ernie had a family thing come up, like somebody passed or something, and he had to split for a day. So they said, well, why don't we just keep Will around? And so I cut six tracks on her, on her uh, Soul Sessions record, which was great fun. She was really a soulful singer, and Josh was great. And it was fun playing with Ernie, because, you know, who didn't, you know, learn all that... How, what was that? There we go. There, I hadn't thought of that lick in a long time. <laughs> it's your thing. <laughs> and, uh... And so, you know, to play with him for, he came back and we kept cutting tracks and working mm -hmm. together. And it was great to be in headphones with him. We haven't heard all that. And he was, he took, isn't it, who's that lady? He took the real yeah. Hendrixy sounding kind yeah. of solos and stuff. That was great. Josh, well, when, um, after I'd really been sort of, uh, you know, incorporated into the Muscle Shoals rhythm section, Malico, the label, the, the R&B label from Jackson, Mississippi, bought Muscle Shoals Sound Studio and started bringing us, you know, Johnny Taylor and Bobby Bland and, and Etta James and Little Milton and Shirley Brown and Lattimore. And I did their records for years, you know. I did three Bobby Bland records. Great hearing him. First time, first time I ever played with Bobby Bland, we were doing this song. It went... Just one of those... Something like that, but I, but you know what, I went like that, and he went, Bobby just, he, he goes, take your time, son. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up becoming really good friends, and I don't know how he lived through those things, because he ate, he would order, and I don't even know where in Muscle Shoals you can get them, but he called them listeners and trotters. But they would come in biscuits, and they were ears and feet. <laughs> and the ears looked like the tongue of this shoe burnt with hairs coming out of it. And there was so much grease in the brown bag that it would come to, it was transparent. The bag was transparent. And I was trying to eat healthy and it was like, whoa. He had quadruple bypass surgery about two years after I met him. <laughs> but uh, Bobby was a pleasure. Uh, I loved hearing, uh, actually it's funny because he had had Wayne Bennett on guitar, who's an icon. You know, he played with Bobby Bland for 35 years. Played a big body guitar, an ES-350, yep. you know, which is thicker than a 335, and yep. it's got the F holes in it. And Wayne Bennett was just, you know, all that stormy Monday, and, you know, just a great guitar player. And he had just passed, and so Bobby shows up, and they go, and this is, you know, your keyboard player, Clayton Ivey, and this is your drummer, Roger Hawkins. And if you don't know who Roger Hawkins is, he's the drummer on When a Man Loves a Woman. Mustang Sally Land of a Thousand Dances, Kodachrome, I'll Take You There, Respect Yourself, Respect by Aretha, Chain, 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 Think. House of Jack built. I mean, he's old time rock and roll, Main Street, half of Bob Seger stuff, but one of the most iconic, to me, he and Al Jackson were the two greatest R&B drummers of all time. There's different, but there isn't better, you know? And so, anyway, I got sidetracked by saying Roger Hawkins and David Hood, you know, was the guy who did the bass part on I'll Take You There. Do, 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 do. And by the way, that track was cut eight tracks. There were three mics on the drums, two overheads and a kick. There was a bass, there was a whirly, there was a rhythm guitar, and there was Mavis singing. Oh, it was just eight tracks. It was just eight tracks. <laughs> and they bounced it down and they added background vocals and whatever. But uh, you can make some great music without all the technology. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to rhythm playing? Uh, well, that's mostly what I do. That's where the song is. But oh, I was going to just finish one story yeah. by... He comes in, he looks over at me, and I was tuning up a Strat, and Bobby looks at me and goes, and this is your guitar player, Will McFarlane. And Bobby goes, that's a rock guitar. And I went, well, Buddy Guy plays one. He goes, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, rhythm, to me, I can honestly say that in, I mean, really 90%, that's probably a fact conservative for me to say 90% of the work that I do for people when I'm working at Fame or at the nut house or whatever, 90% of the work that I do, I hit no more than two notes, you know, two mm -hmm. strings. I mean, 
very little. There's We're very little. Adjust your mic here. Yep. There you go. Am I back? You're good. You had to let you know, I can really shake them down. You had, a, <laughs> you had rocked a little too hard and knocked it out. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> but, um, you know, when you realize that you're, you're having a conversation, you're in the studio with a drummer and a bass player, and he's covering a lot of the low stuff. And you got to make sure that, you know, if you... If you go to a three in your bass and the bass player doesn't, it could be odd. Or if he goes to yeah. a three and you don't, it could be odd. Yet you need to, it's a conversation. We're all listening to each other and, oh, I didn't know you were going to go there. Let's go. And just have just enough under your hood to have, to answer the question, so to speak. And, and you've got a piano player and he's cursed with an overview. He's trying to cram in everything he can. <laughs> and so as a guitarist, if you cover too much space, it doesn't sound good on tape. That's why iconic stuff like Cornell Dupree's opening lick on Rainy Night in Georgia, like that. You know, that kind of thing. It's just two, two stops, they call them. You know, we'll refer to just two notes that you're playing. And honestly, most of the, of the tracking that I do, I almost never hit more than two notes, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's just, and it helps to have a certain amount of theory because certain styles of music, like R&B, for example, like A Rainy Night in Georgia. If you went, it would almost go Tex-Mex or it would almost yeah, yeah, be country. Yeah. But if you go, you know what I mean? The fourths keep it just a little bit edgier to me. Yeah, yeah. Or if I go, using sixths, and they call them six because they're, you know, you know, two, three, four, five, six. If you finish the scale, they're six notes away from each other. It doesn't mean there's a six to the chord. There is here, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I hit an A6, they'll, a lot of times they'll say, Will, on this one, I want a six, nine feel in it. Because you know, there's your nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, there's your 13. You just kind of count around, you know, and you'll find stuff out. And, uh, and so I'll use sixes a lot because, you know, something might go, you know, stuff like that really seems to fit that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. whereas, whereas if I were going, you know, I took it out of the vibe, but if I went, yeah. See what I'm saying? Six nines really work well there with that, whereas they didn't, not really, you know, work there. Or if I was playing a, like a country thing, and you might want to go, you know, or you might want thirds. Go to the D. And I've never hit more than two notes and all that stuff. Whatever, you know. I'm just showing you how different the thirds felt than the sixths yeah. or the fourths. They're just very, very different. And all I'm doing is I'm dividing, here's an A chord, you know. And obviously those are fourths. That's a third up, one, two, three. And a lot of the number thing, like I write number charts for us to record to. And really, a lot of people are intimidated by that, but we've many times said, I'm sure you've heard people say, it's just one, four, five, 12 bar, or whatever. That just means you've got the one of the, the scale, the four of the scale, and the five of the scale. Mm -hmm. Bum, 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 wild thing. Bum, 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 bum. Or, you know, Louie, Louie. You know, is one, four, five. And instead of going do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, if you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it just makes total sense. Because if I go one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I could go like it went six, five, seven flat, six, five, three flat, one. You just know what they're going to sound like. So you can go. You know what the note's going to sound like because it's intervallic. You're used to the intervals between the notes. And so all of us who do sessions, especially here in Nashville in the south and down there, we, we think in numbers. And so if I go one, two, three, four, five, so one, 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 four, four, five, five, five. And you just think like that. And so you can train your ear to know that stuff. It's not just like you have to have perfect pitch. You can train yourself to have relative pitch. Mm -hmm. And that really helps. That'll really help you. Because then you can start jamming with people, even if you only know three chords. And an off chord, they call it, you know? <laughs> it's just C, F, and G in an off chord, and you just have to figure out whether the off chord's the six minor or the two minor, right? <laughs> and that's just one listen through. You go, oh, it was a six, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I go, there's the six, here's the four, five. Then I'm back to the six, to the two, to the four, five, one. And you just hear where all that is. You hear where the interval, intervals are. And so you divide a chord up. You just divide it up, whether you put them notes together. There's my fourth. Or you can go, those are the six. Or I can go, and you can see all of the shapes are within the shape of the A chord, really. Yeah. And if you know that's an A, and that's an A, and that's an A. That's an E, that's an E, that's an E. That's a C, that's a tougher one, C, you know? Because these kind of chords, that's an F, you know? And most people don't learn to bar like that. But, but if you do, it'll really help you out because, for example, most people start soloing with a pentatonic lick. whatever, you know, they start that five. But if you add the flat five, you start to swing. You know, but if you go to this position, you know, I'm all just sort of, I'm swinging there because this position is just a great. Yeah. I wasn't thinking as much as I was just trying to move through, you know, from that position, that C position really helps break you out of your pentatonic box. And yeah. everybody gets stuck in that box eventually. Yeah. It's just the truth. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, yeah Trevor, what you got? From, um, over the pond, Will, we are hearing a great emphasis on triad in the, in the education world. Guitars there. Everything's triad based. Was with Guthrie on, uh, right. Monday, and he was very, very strong on trumpet. He yeah, he's been playing with like Wayne Krantz and people like that. He's been playing with Oz. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I haven't totally got, yeah, but they'll decide, okay, this whole solo, I'm just using two triads. And a lot of times they don't even land on the one. No. Yeah. You know, they just solo around. And I'm not really adept at that. I'm actually lately because. I've watched a couple of guys that are breaking me out of my diatonic rut. They use that half tone, whole tone, more of a diminished thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is really cool. And little by little, I am incorporating that in as a little more than the triad thing. Like if I did it, they'll decide, okay, my solo in the key of D major seven is an A6 and a, you know, and a, F sharp minor or something like that, you know, and they'll decide those are the only notes I'm going to hit in this solo. And they get very adept at it. And I've heard it too, but I, I haven't really ventured that far out into that, into those waters. 
But I get it mathematically. In my brief stint at a university, I did go for math. <laughs> but, uh, but I understand what they're doing, you know, because there's so much math in music. Well, I'd never heard of caged. I just, uh, until re recently, somebody said, yeah, they use the cage system. But I actually, in most cases, I don't really think of the D as much as I think of it as a whole C. Mm -hmm. You know, because here's the C, and if I, and if I move it up to here, the reason I, I go to the D is because I have an open D note. You know, it gives you that. But really, if you think of it here, you have, you have a little more lyrical movement if you think of the whole C. So I'm more, what am I? <laughs> I guess I'm just, uh, I'm C-A-E. <laughs> Whatever that is. It's a Kai, it's a small island. <laughs> but, uh, but the E, you know, as I said, here's, here's my E, there's my E, there's my E, and you know, A or whatever, you know, C. And, um, and if I think of this, if I know here's my E, and then there's my next E, and then there's my next E, and there's my next E, that if you attach them just diatonically, not even full scales, just pentatonic scales, I went through all of those positions on my way up. Same thing with A. And, you know, you wonder how people are doing that. It's funny, I used to give a guitar lesson or two to some neurosurgeons when I lived in the, in the Duke area of North Carolina. And they would be intimidated to go up high. They go, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. I go, my God, if you're a 30 second of an inch off, the guy never walks again, you know? <laughs> I said, if I hit a wrong note, nobody dies, you know? <laughs> you know, so what are you afraid of? You know, nobody dies if you hit a wrong note. And as they say, you're never more than a half step away from the right note. So you can adjust pretty quickly. But, but, but I tend to be E, A, and C. Those are the, because very, you know, you're not thinking that G position, you know, much, you know. It is, but it opens up the back of your hand. Like if you don't, like if you just learn these and, you know, or, but if you learn this, it opens it up and you see, and it's just, it becomes very fluid. It's like anything else. It seems tough at the beginning but eventually your muscle memory will get it, I promise. It yeah. does, so C was the last one to come for all of us, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the barred C was the, the first, the last one to make it in. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's so, it opens so much swing, it just really does. And, and it gives you more <laughs> options, e even, even, you know, as opposed, <laughs> if you went, it's the same exact notes, I just approach them yeah. from realizing that relative major minor, if you treat an A, even if it's a major chord, you can go. Because it's a blue note. It's not a three flat and it's not a three. It's, it's a blue note. <laughs> and, um, but as opposed to, if I went. Here's my C chord, like a C major seven is the same as an A minor six. You know, it's just in a lot of ways. So, so if I just go. And I'm right back in A, you know, I'm right back. And so I can still. See what I'm doing? It gives you a little bit of swing in your music to, to, to go to the next position up instead of. Play it like it's a C, like it's a C shape, or it's an E shape, technically. It's just an E major seven kind of a thing. It's a C, and if I go. You see what I'm doing? I'm, and I'm not thinking as much about it because I'm talking. 
and I don't know if that had a great feel to it, but I was trying to show you mathematically how I think. Yeah. And that's, that's what gives me the permission when I'm on a session and the keyboard player goes someplace or, or something they go, I know he goes, oh, he just went up. He just went up that one position, you know, or he went to a dominant seven. You know, and if you just mix, actually, I'm not a modal guy really, but a Mixolydian mode is, is like if you listen to the Grateful Dead and you wonder what Jerry Garcia is thinking, it's just all Mixolydian. Mm -hmm. It's just all Mixolydian, which is a major scale. And instead of going, you go. So if it goes, you know. See what I'm saying? I mean, just, I was just playing a Mixolydian scale, however, any notes I felt like. I wasn't even thinking necessarily, but not one of them was wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, some of them were better than others, but, <laughs> but none of them were wrong per se. You see what I'm saying? So if you mix a Mixolydian, I I'll finish this thought and then I will answer that question because I go off on rabbit trails. You've picked up on that yet? <laughs> but here's my, here's for example, there's a note in both scales, Mixolydian and blues scale. And that's just Mixolydian. That's blues scale. Mixolydian, both. Blues scale, both. You know, Mixolydian, blues scale, both. So look, at the, if I go, which ones are wrong? Like if he just went, if, if you just went like this, if I went, I mean, I just hit them all. And I mean, none of them were particularly grievous. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so if you can major minor, that's what all those, uh, Sometimes they'll really define the two. See, I mean, I'm, I'm really just not deviating from those two scales. I did just slightly deviate from the Mixolydian scale there on one note, but other than that, I was just blue scale and mixolydian if you blend them both together so much permission you know yeah, yeah. that you know you know all those notes all fit and you can use them all at any time so i was working with a trainer and you know he was going through all the, the master blues artists and stuff like that he says you know really they don't know that they yeah don't know any of that stuff oh i know they just play from here from that's here. it and so it's a rabbit hole it is a rabbit hole and we're at a certain level. We're not beginners. We're not pros. We're kind of in the middle. Yeah. And we get overwhelmed by that. Yeah. And uh, so anyway. Well, you know, if you just know three chords, one, four, five, you can sit on your back porch and play 75% of the songs you like. <laughs> I mean, that's a weird thing to say, but it's amazing how many songs, uh, and add an off chord, add the six minor, add the two minor, and you've got my girl, you know. You know, one, two, four, five, my girl. You know, I got sunshine. Four. When it's cold outside, I've got the month of May. Then one, two, four, I get you. Say what can make me feel this way? It's my girl talking about. See, and it's just a four chord song. It sounds so sophisticated with do 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 do. You know the strings and all this stuff. But you can sit on your back porch and play it C, D minor, F, G, and. And the point of music is obviously it's just, it's, 
I mean, Einstein said everything has a frequency, and if it's at its right frequency, then it can't possibly not be healthy. So I'm just convinced that music is this healing force, and that when we sit on our back porch, even when we're just by ourselves, even if the electric guitar isn't plugged in, the, the frequencies that we're feeling in our bodies are just, you know, it's, it's a mystical thing, you know? And it's not, it's a gift to us. Hmm. And I just think that, that, you know, going down a rabbit hole can paralyze you. You know, like at one point for, you know, I had to learn a Steely Dan song last weekend, you know, to go play with Bernard Purdy. Because he invented that. They call that the Purdy Shuffle. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, Jeff Beccaro in Rosanna said, I just stole this from Bernard, Bernard Purdy, you know, and added a little John Bonham or whatever. But that, and well, the danger on the rock. And I had to learn these chords. And I was really glad I'd gone down a few rabbit trails in my life and realized that, you know, getting to this change or this passing chord is, is you know, a half diminished or whatever, or this is a raised nine, and then it goes to a flat nine. And, but once again, it's all mathematical. If I start with an E chord and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's a raised nine. Hendrix. You know, it's that, that raised nine. But if you go. Yeah, I mean, that, that was still just really C, F, and G. I just used some passing chords to get to C, F, and G, you know? So I sat in a master class with Matt Sch Schofield. Uh, John Schofield? Or, oh, Matt. Oh, Matt. I don't yeah. know Matt. Anyway, he was um, talking about tone, and he did a very simple D e blues. And he said, anybody can do this, but can you sound like this? Yeah. And it was the tone. Yeah, yeah, said, yeah. It's not... And yeah. everyone keeps saying it's in your fingers. It's in, it's all, it's. And he had nothing but an amp. Yeah. And uh, a tuner. That's well, we all learn to play like that. We all learn to just play an amp. Right now I have tremolo on. If I turn it off, and I turn everything off, if I had. I just had a little reverb on it, you know? But if you go. It's just the guitar into the amp, you know? Let's play something to finish out as we're as we're kind of coming around the end of the. Have I made sense? End of the show. Yeah, <laughs> well, I appreciate. It. I wasn't fishing. I was just hoping that I had not. You know, I went to a a guitar seminar one time and I didn't even know what they were talking about. You know, <laughs> it was just like, and I thought, you know, we have a saying that we say when we're being really humorous down there, like Clayton Ivey has never met a half diminished that he didn't like. And he always tries to fit it in on the simplest country songs. He'll just find a... You know, he'll just walk to that A minor when the artist goes, no, I don't want that, I just want to... But some people, and, I, and, and our expression is, too hip for the room. <laughs> and, you know, now if somebody comes in and we're cutting... Like we cut What You Won't Do For Love on Dorothy Moore one time. And she did, remember the song Misty Blue? My yeah. whole world is... I love Dorothy. I, she's maybe one of the most delightful humans I've ever known. I did a bunch of records for her. And we cut What You Won't Do, You'll Try Anything. And I don't even remember it now, but I had to do... I, I don't even remember the parts. But um, I was glad I knew enough to change chords at the same time. <laughs> but then again, I ended up on stage with Kirk Whalum one time, and they were supposed to have Paul Jackson Jr. He's a brilliant guitar player, and he was doing yep. uh, American Idol or something. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, at the last minute, couldn't get away from the taping of American Idol. And they said, well, Will's going to be there. He's a session guy. He can read this chart. They sent me a seven-page L.A. chart, and the first chord on it was a B13 flat nine. <laughs> and, and I sort of went... That's what it was. You know, and I went, my God! 
Yeah, and they had flatted the seven too, so it was a six flat nine. And, and, and I'm running through it and I'm reading the chart and I'm just changing chords and then they go like. And then, and then before they'd go to a major seven, they'd play like. They'd play this triad behind the flat. You know, and it, during a break, at one point I looked over at Kirk Whalem, who's a brilliant guy and a delightful guy and, and very knowledgeable. I turned to him, I said, you know, I know these chords. I've just never done them in a row. <laughs> He burst out laughing. It was good. I got the same reaction from him, you know. <laughs> and Abe Laborial, you know, came over and patted me on the back and went, you know, it was, it, he was going, you, you did well. And what he meant was nice try, you know, but <laughs> and when you hung in there and I realized I wasn't actually playing with them. I was just changing chords at the same time. And that's different. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be able to play. Yeah. And so generally they have to dumb it down a little for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Well, thank you I so much for it. being uh, a part of tonight, and what a joy to know you. And we've been we've been friends yeah. for a while. You're a delightful friend, and uh, you invited me to do the original Gibson thing you were doing at yeah, one point. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I brought my Les Paul to that one. Yeah, and we got you, and you wanted a Gibson shirt that had that. That had that, sh- and you got it for me, and it's right on the top. It's the next T-shirt I'm going to wear. <laughs> <laughs> We went to they great make, lengths go, with Gibson go, to do to make that shirt happen that, for you. That's there's a Gibson shirt. My my Les Paul is a standard, but it's it's black and cream. You know, it looks like the blow by blow Les Paul on, on Jeff Beck's Rest His Soul, Jeff Beck's blow by blow record. Yeah, yeah. And they found me the T-shirt. They did after that first thing, and and I felt a little out of my element playing that Les Paul with you, but it yeah. it, it was uh, no, it was a great great fun, yeah. great fun, but. Uh, but I, anyway, I just, I just hope that every little bit that we, earn, that we learn just makes you happy, that it doesn't become a burden to you to have to, to have to. Yeah. You know, the point is to get to, you know, that we, we who are drawn to the guitar, it's a brilliant instrument. I mean, if you pick up a mandolin, you have to go a whole nother two frets to get to the next string. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's just a mind blow to me. It just keeps me not as good on that instrument. But this, you know, you can just go one, four, five, and you don't even have to move your hand. You can go. (laughs) You can play Louie Louie and not even move your hand. Economy of motion. That's like, with, you know, we have basketball players in this room. Every now and then, people just make it look so graceful. And then it was like Steve Martin once saying, you know, some people just really have a way with words and other people not have way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so, you know, it, it's delightful that, that you're drawn to this instrument that actually may be the easiest instrument to get pretty good at. It's as hard as any other one to get real good at. But you can get, yeah. you can learn three chords and sit on your back porch in, in a, a really quick period of time, much more than French horn or <laughs> sitar or, <laughs> you know, or, or piano even. You know what I'm saying? It's a delightful instrument. If you're drawn to it, let it be that. Let it be delightful to you because yeah. delight-directed study always bears more fruit than, yeah. man, I got to learn this. I'm cramming for a test. Yeah. No, you're not. Yeah. You know, I hope there's not a test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know yet, but we're hoping. That's like, you know, the math phobic. There was an old far side that had math phobic's worst nightmare. And it shows a guy standing at the pearly gates. and There's an angel standing there and he goes, well, everything seems to be in order here, except there's just one more question. A train leaves Chicago going 50 <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> Two hours later, a train leaves Philly. When do they, you know, and the guy just, you know, I'm not getting into heaven now. <laughs> thank you so much for being part. We, we probably should land this ship, I suppose. But thank you so much it's my for being pleasure. part of it. <laughs> Did you want to play something? Yeah, just start something, I guess. What, uh, uh, any particular key? No.
Jesus. <laughs> I felt like I was a half step behind everything I really wanted to do. I was in math mode. I started thinking, well, maybe I'll show them something that I talked about earlier, and then I'll show them something that I talked about earlier, and I was half, as I said, a beat behind everything I wanted to do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for being a part Appreciate of this Appreciate your response. Hey, thanks for joining in. We will see you guys next time.